in his mate, indeed. I don't know. Beyonce, probably. The beats are coming fast and hot at the moment. It's um, Asis and Galatea by Handel. It's on the Sweets and Symphonies of a Solitary Wanderer. Where am I going to put my water? How far can I go this way without losing? Yeah, I'll put it over here. That'll be fun. It'll give me a reason to walk around. I think you have to watch Sam's seminar. Right, I think I'm going to get started anyway because I want to get this done within about half an hour. Um, right, no more handle. So, welcome to Sam's seminar. Uh, this is the third of my Sam's seminar um, sessions. Um, this is going to look at Plato, Confucius and the Axial Age. Um, the Axial Age being the historiographical term that is used to define the Axial, the, the time at which thinking in, in the ancient world changed. So um, this was uh, content that I learnt while studying my Masters in St Andrews uh, under the supervision of um, Dr Rory Cox, who is both a medievalist and a classicist. Um, so the works that have been used to put this together are Plato's Crito, um, Plato's Republic, Book One, Confucius's Analects, um, the US China edition, uh, John Locke's Two Treaties of Government, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, these are kind of ones that are referenced, but they're not pivotal because this is specifically on ancient scholars. But they're, if you're interested, they're things that are referenced in Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Um, so those are the kind of core texts that we're going to be looking at. But mainly the Crito, the Republic Book One and the Analects by Confucius. So um, in this seminar, week three of the seminars that I've done, um, we're delving into the realm of a highly protective discipline, um, which is the classics, the, uh, the classicists. And um, we're tasked here with looking at a few different classicists, um, but specifically I've picked Plato um, from the ancient Greek world and I've picked Confucius from ancient China because they give us a good reference point for what we will then move on to, which is this term in historiography, the Axial Age, okay? So we'll come to that in the second part, but first of all, we'll have a look at the texts themselves. So the Crito, um, the edition I was looking at was the 1969 edition in the last days of Socrates. Um, and in the Crito, Plato outlines a form of proto-contract theory, um, suggesting that individuals within a polity have a responsibility for one another stemming from the implicit consent given through their upbringing and participation within society. So what we, what we see in the Crito is this very early version of what will become in the Age of Enlightenment social contract theory. Um, so this is shown when Plato writes, did we not give you life in the first place? Implying that through the nurturing of the polity, bringing kids up, um, giving them an education, allowing them to live even, I mean, that's just a very basic right, obviously. Um, this means that there's an implicit consent for you to have responsibility um, within the society that has brought you up. Plato also says that the individual has in fact undertaken to do anything we tell him because of being raised because of 
having access to a home, food, water, um, health treatment, whatever kind of uh, structure of society, because you've been raised within that polity, you have an obligation to listen to anything that the law within that polity demands of you, okay? Um, so this foreshadows John Locke's idea of tacit consent. So you don't have to um, wholeheartedly subscribe to the laws of a regime. They are implied because you are participating within society. So it's always that question of, you know, oh, well, I don't vote, so, um, you know, politics doesn't matter to me. Well, you participate in society, okay? Um, so therefore, you tacitly consent to everything that this, that that polity enacts in terms of laws, in terms of its social mores, in terms of everything about how a society operates, you're implicitly, tacitly subscribing to. So this is something that is seen in Plato's Crito and foreshadows what John Locke says. The, the Crito holds a strong contractarian perspective. So the contractarianism differs from what's called contractualism. A contractarian perspective of social contract theory, of social responsibility to one another within a polity, um, is a form of social contract theory that grounds morality in the state and its laws, resembling Hobbes's belief in the state's power to save us from chaos in the state of nature. Plato expresses his stance clearly. Do you imagine that a city can continue to exist if legal judgments have no force but are nullified and destroyed by private persons? This passage underscores the necessity of upholding the laws for a moral society's survival. Socrates' acceptance to drink the hemlock that sentenced him to death exemplifies this. Socrates, of course, was offered a chance to escape from the society, but he drinks the hemlock anyway because he was raised within that specific state and he accepts that having been raised by it, he must also ab ab abide by the laws which are acted upon him, which embodies the ultimate contractarian principle that one must live and die by the laws of the society to which they owe their life. So that's contractarianism. That's contractarianism within the Crito. So turning to book one of the Republic, the copy that I was using for um, my research when I was doing this uh, was the 1955 Penguin Classics edition. And in book one of the Republic, Plato sets up a fundamental contrast between the rational and the irrational, where the passions represent the latter, leading individuals away from living an ethical life. The ethical person, Plato argues, has escaped from the madness and slavery of the passions. So he's very much against desire, um, you know, all those kind of yeah, desires, lusts, um, all those kind of emotions that could lead one astray from what he sees as the rational path, okay? Um, achieving an ethical life for Plato requires a steadfast character that seeks truth beyond the material world. Plato contends that wealth and material gain can never satisfy the soul, as a bad man won't be contented even if he's rich. So that's a, a great passage from the Republic, book one. This leads Plato to interrogate the nature of justice. He rejects the idea that justice is merely acting immorally for moral purposes, as it would be akin to stealing, though done to help a friend or harm an enemy. Justice cannot simply be about punishment or retribution, a notion Plato critiques because it implies that moral peoples would act immorally to correct the immoral, an absurdity that can later addresses in the Enlightenment. That's why I put the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals in the reading list that will be in the caption of this video when it's published. Um, so you can't say, oh, well, what if everyone, um, did, 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 you know, would commit immoral acts to um, correct a wrong that's already been done? Well, that's just a never ending cycle. Um, so Plato, through the character of Thrasymachus in book one, 
of the Republic presents a very cynical view. He suggests that justice is simply the interest of the stronger party. This is a very famous uh, excerpt from Republic Book One about the idea that justice is just the power of the stronger and it's just a way of expressing the power that the stronger party has, whether that's a political party that's one power and wants to exert its opinion. Like, it's this very kind of, oh, to hell with politics sort of opinion. But if this is true, this implies that justice, or right, is what is in the interests of only ever the stronger party. With democratic laws favouring democracy and tyrannical laws favouring tyranny. However, Plato disputes this as the true path of justice. He's a, you know, a master of any craft, like a ship's captain, serves the interests of those who are under their command, not their own. You wouldn't treat your crew badly if you're sailing in rough seas to get across the water. So it doesn't make sense that the idea that justice can only ever be the interest of the stronger party, because sometimes the lower parties are the very essence of the state in, in this analogy, that the sailors sailing through rough water need to be treated well, because they're the ones who are going to get you to safety. So justice can't always be the solely the interest of the stronger party. So therefore, the just man is knowledgeable and good, while the unjust is ignorant and bad. Justice, Plato concludes, is essential for a functioning society, as it fosters unity both within the individual and the state. Without it, division ensues, rendering the individual and society incapable of effective action. Justice allows the mind to function well, as it is the virtue of the mind. Therefore, a just life leads to prosperity and happiness, making justice inherently more rewarding than injustice. I'm going to take a quick pause and have a glass of water. So getting back to it, for the second part of the, the texts that we're looking at in terms of the classics, I turn to Confucius's Analect, using the 1901 US-China Institute edition. I had briefly encountered Confucius during my undergraduate studies in classical political thought, but interestingly, Confucius lived during a period so close to Socrates and the Buddha, and contributing to transformative thinking across East Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and Europe, that I thought it was crucial to delve back into his work and, and look at why so many scholars in so many different parts of the world were addressing the same fundamental ideas, the same fundamental issues that society faces, and coming up with ideas to resolve them. So what does Confucius say about virtue and ethical behaviour? In Confucius's Analect, Confucius begins with an exploration of virtue, which he defines as treating everyone with the same respect and care that one would show to a great guest. So this implies that class and status for Confucius are irrelevant. In moral interaction, each person deserves compassion and respect. From this foundation, Confucius moves to a formulation of the Golden Rule, a contractualist notion. We were talking about contractarianism earlier. Contractualism, which presents in other traditions, do not do to others what you would not wish to be done unto yourself. That's that famous Christian teaching. We see it in the Enlightenment with Immanuel Kant, but we also see it here with Confucius. And to quote Christ, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Confucius is saying, do not do to others what you would not wish to be done to yourself. 
Such similarities across cultures suggests a human drive to develop ethical guidelines for communal living, offering fascinating opportunities for philological and anthropological cross comparisons, which I was just referencing and can be taken further. But the philological argument would be, oh, they must have all had a shared origin and they all sort of distributed and diffused across the world. So that's why we have this golden rule in different cultures. The anthropologist would say, well, actually, most cultures were dealing with relatively similar issues at the time. So they all came up with ways to suggest to their people to be ethical. OK, so that's Confucius on virtue. Confucius then turns in the Analects to prudence, authenticity and ritual. Confucius goes on to emphasise that perfect virtue comes through what he terms prudence, calm consideration, authenticity. Virtuous individuals should be cautious in their speech, slow in decision making, not being head hot and rushing into decisions, and true to themselves, as authenticity breeds a certain fortitude and a life free from anxiety. He also warns against flattery and insult, so over impressing, trying to be something you're not inauthentic and also to over impress to other people. Noting that the truly virtuous are unaffected by such attacks, neither soaking slander nor startling statements are successful in convincing the truly virtuous individual of anything other than what they wholeheartedly believe. Ritual and ceremony, and this is interesting because this is something you see come up in religion, but ritual and ceremony, according to Confucius, are also essential components of a moral society. He emphasises that there is a certain substance in what he terms ornament, but really, when we think of ornament, we probably think of like something on the, on the shelf or whatever. But ornament means ritual in, what, in the way, in the sort of uh, semantics of his time. And obviously this is translated, but that's, that's what, what is meant here, at least. It means ritual. Um, are also essential components of a moral society, those rituals, those ornaments. You need them, fundamentally, to maintain an ordered society. And this is because the rituals bind a community together. They're not merely decorative, but contain intrinsic value. So these communal acts, rituals, ornaments serve as the substance that binds society and creates social cohesion. So what does he turn to next? He turns to the pursuit of truth and moral leadership. Confucius places great importance on the pursuit of truth. Individuals should continuously strive towards what is right, especially those in positions of power. The ruler's mind, he suggests, should be fully occupied with the governing of the state and doing what is right for the nation, without distraction. The pursuit of the moral path is not an occasional endeavour, but a constant journey toward improvement within the boundaries of tradition and propriety. Confucius argues, in a similar vein to Plato, that justice and societal harmony do not stem from punishment but from improving moral character and leading by example. He metaphorically describes the ruler's influence. And this is, again, a very, very famous passage. The grass must bend so the wind will blow across it. The grass must bend and the wind blows across it. So if the, the force, which here he's saying is the wind, is the ruler, the ruler of the state, our prime minister, the US's president, whatever. They are the wind, and so the grass blows. It is the responsibility of the leader to be virtuous in order to inculcate, to, in order to influence virtue in its citizens. And, and that makes a lot of sense because people look up, well, some look, look up to the leaders as the exemplar, the moral exemplar, to use sort of more Aristotelian language. There's a distinction between fame and genuine distinction in Confucius's writing. Um, it's the final important point, I'd say, from this text before we actually turn to the historiography. Um, 
But in the Analects, Confucius makes this distinction between the man of fame and the man of genuine distinction. The latter, he says, loves righteousness. That's what he seeks as an as a individual. He looks for righteousness and remains humble in his righteousness. So perhaps think of, I don't know, the Pope or um, Buddhist monks who take themselves away to the monastery and focus on what is right. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be an aesthete. It doesn't mean that you have to withdraw from society. But you focus on yourself, on an authentic sense of what is right and what, what is good in, uh, for me and therefore for society. But he says that, that there is a difference there compared to the former, the man um, of fame. So distinct, genuine distinction versus fame. The man of fame seeks external praise for his supposed virtue never realising his inauthenticity deep down. Whereas the man of genuine distinction seeks righteousness for its own sake, not for recognition of his righteousness. So you don't have, you're not going out moralising, you're not telling people, well, look how great I am, I'm, you know, uh, I'm, you know, um, putting up on, I don't know, whether it was on social media or whatever, to prove that I'm a good person, Okay. Um, that, to, to Confucius, would be inauthentic. The authentic man of genuine distinction compared to the man of fame would love righteousness for himself, not to prove to others that he is righteous. So, yeah, let's turn to the historiography and the contextual analysis. Um, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, Right. So after discussing these texts, we turn to the broader concept of what's referred to as the Axial Age. This was a term coined by Carl Jaspers in the 1940s, and his text is in the reading list that I've compiled. Um, it was influenced by uh, Hegel, um, and Jaspers proposed that between the 8th and 3rd centuries BCE, because of course it was going backwards in terms of the in terms of the dates, um, there was a widespread philosophical and religious transformation across various regions of the world, including the Greco-Roman world, Persia and China. This excluded Africa, the Americas and Oceania. While the idea of a synchronised global intellectual shift is fragile, it is clear that similar ideas were emerging independently across cultures without direct contact. Plato and Confucius, as we've seen, two key figures um, in the readings that I've just gone through, are often listed as part of this so-called Axial Age. However, the pre-Axial Age was characterised by an intertwining of the transcendent and the mundane, as, um, as it's put. Uh, for example, kings and oracles often claim divine legitimacy, blurring the lines between the physical and metaphysical. So there we're talking about the pre-axial age, um, which is what the axial age is distinct of. So when Confucius, Plato, um, Aristotle, when all of these individuals are writing, they start to separate what are termed the transcendent and the mundane, the mundane being your day-to-day -day temporal life on the ground, uh, the transcendental being the gods and the spirits, etc. Um, we know that in ancient Greek culture, these things were often merged, um, and the philosophers didn't, didn't believe that these things were merged. So in the Axial Age, scholars like Plato, scholars like Confucius, um, wanted to separate the gods from the day-to-day -day world, the transcendental and the mundane, okay? Um, so kings and oracles who claimed divine legitimacy and tried to blur the lines that sometimes they were a god, sometimes they weren't, um, were separated. The physical and the metaphysical world became separated in this period of the Axial Age. These, these scholars, Confucius and Plato in particular, were questioning these traditional narratives within their own regional boundaries. And while Jasper's concept offers a useful framework for understanding broad intellectual trends, it's also important to critique its homogenising tendency. We often have an approach in 
the history of ideas, which kind of says, well, if something was happening in the West, let's have a look and see if it's happening anywhere else. Well, why can't it be something unique in itself happening somewhere else? Um, I think Jasper's ideas around an axial age are useful and really interesting, but I can see that we kind of see what happens with Plato, the ancient Greeks, and we go, oh, they had ideas about transforming society. Perhaps there's some someone in Far East Asia who's doing the same, and we kind of force these terms that we've learned in ancient philosophy, in ancient Greek, um, onto other parts of the world, which is quite neo-colonial, and we should be very wary of doing that. But the idea of an axial age, the idea of a period between the 8th and 3rd centuries BCE, where philosophers all over the globe, without interacting, started to question the same things about society, about religion, is truly fascinating. So it is still a useful term. Perhaps a more nuanced case-by-case -case approach to addressing um, what philosophers were looking at within their own contexts would better capture the diversity and richness of thought across these various civilizations. Um, but, yeah, I mean, essentially that's the Axial Age. You've got the Buddha, you've got um, Socrates, you've got uh, Confucius, and, and of course you've got Christ coming very soon after. You have Zoroastrianism. Um, so all across the Axial period, you, you, you see these ideas emerging that separate the old pre-Axial ideas of there being kind of these merged metaphysical and physical worlds into separated ideas where philosophers are starting to actually address fundamental questions about society in a more nuanced way, okay? So that's today's Sam's seminar on the Axial Age and the ancient thinkers. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, and I'll stick around for any questions if there are any, um, but otherwise I will get this video uploaded and put the, uh, the texts that I used to draw up um, this research. Um, so yeah, thank you very much indeed for joining. And yeah, and I think that'll be about it for today. Um, right, thank you all very much indeed. Oh, um, where does Jesus fit into intellectual history? Well, I, you joined a little bit after George, um, but I was just talking about how in the Analects by Confucius, um, he says essentially the same, iterate, in a slightly different iteration, the same fundamental ideas as the Golden Rule. So in the Analects, which is what about three centuries prior to Christ, uh, Confucius writes, do unto others as you would wish to have them do unto you, which is obviously almost word for word the same as Christ's iteration of the Golden Rule and the same as what we see in the Enlightenment with Immanuel Kant and again another iteration of the Golden Rule in terms of not doing that which cannot be universalised. So in terms of how Christ fits into intellectual history, certainly um, within this period, the Axial Age, um, he fits in in terms of the idea that these concepts, whether ethical, political, um, are emerging in different parts of the world without there being any interaction between the scholars. Um, and why is that happening? Is it philological, which is the old 19th century idea that there was some kind of great diffusion of ideas from a central node? And this was kind of the neo-colonial, well, well, colonial and, and today still sometimes taken up. And that's sort of the neo-colonial kind of quite, uh, you know, quite racist opinion that ultimately ideas had to come from Europe and had to then disseminate across the rest of the uncultured world. Um, so in terms of in intellectual history, um, Christ fits in within exactly this um, period. Um, but as an example of a, a thinker, a writer, who is developing ideas about society and obviously about religion, but specifically when we're looking at kind of like the political elements of it, thinking about how to create an ethical society and how to yeah, structure the polity, which is the same question that um, Confucius is looking at, uh, Buddha is looking at it, Socrates was looking at it earlier. But yeah, if you, when I finish this, um, I'll publish 
this video and you'll see the elements that are shared between yeah things like Christ some of Plato's reporting of the last days of Socrates and Confucius's Analects so yeah I hope that was interesting and yeah anyone who has missed anything can go back and watch this after I have published it shortly right cheerio